Good morning. Um, my name is Don Lai Gong. I'm assistant professor of marine science at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science in the College of William Mary. Um, I'm here to host this uh, exciting panel this morning, and um, uh, we have panelists from a wide range of background, from policy to operations to military. Um, I will give a brief introduction to each of the panelists, but I encourage you to read the uh, bio in the program, which um, lists many of the accomplishments of each of the panelists. Uh, followed by the int uh, panel introduction, I will make an introductory remark about, uh, I'm a scientist, so I'll talk a little bit about the changes happening in the Arctic from a science, uh, physical science perspective and uh, set up uh, the discussion to follow. So first we have Sher Goodman, from, um, who is a senior fellow at the Wilson, Woodrow Wilson International Center. And uh, um, she is a senior advisor for international security at the Center for Climate and Security. Uh, she served as the first deputy on the Secretary of Defense, Environmental and Security from 1993 to 2001. Uh, she currently serves on the board of Atlantic Council and Resilience Center, the Joint Ocean uh, Commission Leadership Council, Marshall Legacy Institute, the National In uh, Executive Committee of U.S. Water Partnership, the Advisory Committee of the U.S. Global Change uh, Research Program, and the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. We have um, Rear Admiral David Titley. He has been serving, he served in the Navy for, uh, who will be joining us remotely, by the way, served in the Navy for 32 years. Uh, she, he was the um, commander of the Naval Meteorology and Operational, uh, Operation, sorry, Na Naval Meteorology and Oceanography Command. Oceanographer and navigator of the Navy and deputy uh, assistant chief of Naval Operations for Information Dominance. Uh, Dr. Tilly is also a fellow of the American Meteorological Society and he's currently serving as professor of practice in the Department of Meteorology and Atmospheric Science, a professor in the School of International Affairs and founding director of Center for Solutions to Weather and Climate Risk at the Pennsylvania State University. And finally, we have um, Scott Genovese, who currently is the Director of Global uh, Maritime Operational uh, Threat Response Coordination Center. And um, he is responsible, he was a active Coast Guard member, he was act serving active duty in the US Coast Guard since 1979 and served uh, with the U.S., uh, jointly with the U.S. Navy during uh, Iraqi freedom um, and um, and as the chief of law enforcement policy for the U.S. Coast Guard from 19, 2004 and 2007. And he was responsible for all aspects of Co U.S. Coast Guard's maritime interdiction efforts. So there's a lot more in these, um, uh, uh, in the, uh, program, so I will get started on the, um, what's going on in the Arctic today. So this is a picture uh, I took on the um, on the bridge of the U.S. Coast Guard uh, icebreaker Healy, and this is a medium class icebreaker. It was on a mission to conduct science operations in the Western Arctic back in 2000, um, 2011. I think one of the things that impressed me during that study was that Arctic, beyond its geopolitical importance, beyond its, the fact that it's very cold still, um, that it is very beautiful. Um, and, and I think to get Arctic policies right, is, I, personally I feel it's more than just about uh, what's happening today and about our, us, but, um, but something more about the future generations as well. So in terms of, 
in terms of how changes in Arctic can impact um, not just Virginia, but United States in general, uh, there are a few things that, um, there are three major aspects. And the first is uh, the melting of the Greenland ice sheet, which has the potential to significantly raise the sea level height uh, around, around the world. And uh, the maximum potential impact is up to seven meters. Of course, we won't get that um, sea level rise anytime soon, but uh, it is a contributing factor, increasingly more so. Uh, currently, the, the rate of sea level rise is about half from rising temperature in the ocean and half from melting ice sheet on land. Uh, in the locally, in this region, we have uh, uh, additional issue of land um, subsistence, uh, land lowering itself due to, um, ge due to ge geological factors. So combining all that, uh, we are in Virginia a, uh, a effectively a sea level rise hotspot around the country and uh, around the world as well. So I will not be talking too much about that because there's a lot of discussions and a lot of uh, people who will be uh, discussing more, more of that. But we do want to focus on uh, the long-term decrease in Arctic sea ice. And that has a uh, potential impact on marine transportation, uh, resource development in the Arctic, national defense, which we'll hear a lot about today, and, uh, and the marine ecosystem. That's happening on a long time scale, uh, in the sense of from years to multiple years up to decades. But on even shorter time scales, for example, days to weeks, uh, we have all experienced winters that are, seems to be much colder than normal or warmer than normal. We have storms moving through our area uh, that seems to be more intense than before. So what is the connection of that in relation to the Arctic? And, um, and scientists are discovering uh, uh, there's now m more connections between the Arctic weather system on the short time scale and what's happening in the lower latitude. So, uh, and I'll show a, a few um, uh, interesting slides from that. I just thought to do an interesting comparison between uh, the Obama administration, which um, the only reason why I picked Obama administration is because that's when the data collection <laughs> ended. Um, I mean, it's ongoing, but that's when the analysis ended uh, for this current um, data set. And compare with Reagan administration, which is spanning over three, three to four decades. And just looking that on that um, time scale, which covers five to six U.S. administrations, you can see the atmosphere in the northern hemisphere has significantly warmed, and the Arctic is warming the fastest. And on average, the temperature warming might be on the scale of one to one and a half degrees uh, over the past hundred years, but over uh, in the Arctic. Specifically, over the past 40 years, it has warmed a spots up to five degrees. And that's known as polar implication. And that's related to uh, the fact that the Arctic has, is unique in that it has sea ice, and sea ice can reflect um, sunlight and, and affects the uh, uh, energy budget in that region. And when sea ice melt, that significantly change eff effectively how reflective um, the Arctic is to solar energy. And, um, because of that uh, change, the Arctic uh, is rising at a, at a rate, temperature in the Arctic is rising at a rate much faster than lower latitude. It's not just the atmosphere, also in the ocean, we have uh, temperature rising over this past 30 years. Um, <coughs> what you see on the right in that, um, in that slide, it shows that weather and climate go through large long-term patterns and there are highs and lows on decadal time scales and right now arguably we're at a high in terms of ocean temperature but the overall trend for ocean temperature is still rising and arguably we are we may be breaking ourselves out of a long-term uh, cy uh, cyclic trend there so we have seen this type of plot uh, uh, in many places and this shows the uh, September sea ice extent in Arctic, in Arctic and how that has decreased over the past uh, 40 years since when satellite oceanography started. And, um, and this trend show that we have, we're 
basically at half of where uh, one measurement first started. And <coughs> excuse me, I'm still getting over a cold. So the big question is, where is it going? And, um, and is this happening uh, beyond just the summertime or uh, in other seasons as well? I found this wonderful plot illustration of sea ice extent in the Arctic that shows for all months of the year from 1979, uh, when <laughs> from the satellite <coughs> data collection started, up to 2017. And what's, when, as you go around this, uh, uh, this plot, it, it moves in time. And as you move radially from the center, it shows the extent of the ice cover. And what's striking is that regardless of which month you're looking at, the ice cover is spiraling in towards, uh, towards zero. And the black line is midsummer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we're not too far from zero, actually. Um, I also want to point out that beyond just the lowest uh, ice extent, which, is, which happens in around mid-September every year, for the two months, right for the month right before and the month right after, which is August and October, it tracks September very closely. The, the extent of it may be a little bit bigger, but for the most part, it follows the September trend. So we're looking at a potentially a season-long Arctic uh, ice-free Arctic Ocean from from uh, August into October. And that's a long time for a lot of things to happen from transportation, commerce, and, um, and if there's an a, a incidence of any sort. Um, and last thing I want to point out is that if you look at September, uh, the maximum, current maximum ice extent, which is around 20 to 22 uh, cubic um, square cubic kilometers, sorry, this is the ice, this, this is the ice volume, is comparable to what we had back in 1979 for um, October, November, and, uh, and, the, and the spring seasons. So uh, the overall extent has significantly <coughs> decreased as well. Okay, so here's the, I guess the billion dollar question is when will Arctic be summertime ice free? I took the liberty of extending the, um, the current trend out to uh, based on just a linear trend as well as taking the more recent faster decrease from the mid 90s to today. And that, the range essentially is from 2040 to 2070. And that's, um, 2040 is just about 20 years away. And um, uh, so sometime in our lifetime, the Arctic will be uh, summertime ice-free. And um, what are we gonna do about that? And how we're going to operate in this uh, new ocean? It's really a new ocean. Um, we have never seen, humans have never experienced an Arctic Ocean like that uh, in our existence. And this is a preview of what's to come. This is from 2012, mid-September. Uh, this is the minimum ice extent that was observed in 2012. <coughs> and it should impress on you how small the ice cover, whoops, how small the ice cover is in the Central Arctic. And if we think in terms of the transport pathways going through the Arctic, both the Northwest path <coughs> Pathway, uh, the, nor the Northeast Seaway, and almost the Central Arctic Way are almost all open. So we'll see more and more, uh, potentially <coughs> more and more <coughs> years like this versus years where there's more ice and there will be a lot of variability between year to year. So um, to predict what's going to happen in the future is a challenging business. We can make a statistical uh, forecast uh, prediction as to what might happen from year to year and give a probability, but that's not very useful from an operational perspective when you need to send ships somewhere or when you need to send cargo through the path, uh, through the transport pathway. And people have done numerical modeling effort uh, using various types of models to make predictions and 
for example, this is a metric using uh, predicting what is the minimum ice extent for each of the year. This is for 2015, 2016, and this is for 2017. And you can see there's widespread among the models. And there's no one that consistently get it right with small error bar. So, um, so that's a challenge, and that requires science, scientists to do a better job to, uh, to get more data, interpret the data better, and design better models going forward to support this new Arctic Ocean. And one of the possibilities for just show example that we have done here at uh, Vims and Willow Mary is using autonomous underwater vehicles to, uh, to observe the Arctic. This is a, a, um, a study that lasted through the whole season from August into October, um, looking at <coughs> the effect of <coughs> uh, Mackenzie River uh, flowing into the Arctic. So lastly, just a, a couple of slides um, on the uh, shorter time scale relationship between the weather in the Arctic and the weather in lower latitude. Here is uh, Hurricane Isabel, which was impacting, which impacted the Re Virginia region back in 20, 2003, and a lot of people remember that. And you can kind of see a uh, weather pattern in the Arctic corresponding at, at that same time. You can see there's general warming in the U.S., and there's general anomalous warming in the Central Arctic and the Western Arctic. So I just want you to, and also warming in the um, Greenland. I want you to, to keep your eye on, um, on this general pattern, and then let me move to another storm that's, uh, that caused a lot of damage, and this is uh, Superstorm Sandy uh, back in 2012. And what's remarkable to me as I uh, plotted this up is this general pattern holds. Um, I don't know if it's a coincidence or whether there's a uh, dynamical connection, and that's something to, uh, I think, to look further into. And here's uh, the more recent one, looking at, uh, this is Hurricane Maria. Again, I see it, another general pattern. So, um, climate change is impacting the Arctic. What's happening there is real. We can observe that on multi-decadal, on, and decadal time scales. There's a lot of interannual inter inter variability. There also appears to be connection at a much shorter time scales of weather events. So my last slide is basically I want to just show a, a, a summary of my understanding. This is very limited based on my uh, view of the funding environment, uh, and there's a lot I don't know about. But the major uh, in, uh, government agencies that are current supporting, currently supporting research effort in the Arctic, that includes uh, National Science Foundation, NASA, uh, the Office of Naval Research, NOAA, uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, North Pacific Research Board, and U.S. Coast Guard. Um, and they have, uh, they all bring different capacities, different platforms, and they have different uh, priorities and research programs, uh, um, but they all bring uh, financial support into the program as well. So without the support of all these federal agencies, uh, we will not have a robust research program we have today. Um, and we hope that, uh, that multi-agency collaboration will continue. And um, as scientists, we definitely appreciate the support from uh, the, um, our government and the general public. So I will end there and then pass um, the uh, discussion to uh, pass the, uh, this to Dr. Goodman, and then um, um, we'll have a qu question Q&A uh, session after everyone um, give, a, uh, give a talk. Okay, let's give a round of applause. Thank you. Great, that was, that was terrific, and thank you for sharing those slides. I moved out there so I could see them better. So uh, it's great to be with you all here today. You're, you're, this is a really terrific uh, and important gathering. I know that here uh, in this community and in this area, you're dealing uh, increasingly with the daily effects of uh, sea level rise and coastal flooding and what that means for your communities what that means for our largest complex of uh, naval installations in the world. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be with you here today. My mission from Heather, 
Thank you, Heather, for organizing this. Great job. Let's give a round of applause to Heather again. Uh, and her colleagues, John Conjure and uh, Liz and the others who, who put this all together. Um, my, my mission was to talk a little bit about the Arctic today and put it in a geopolitical and historical context. Now, um, as Dr. Gong mentioned, I was the first Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security. That's back in the what's now the Dark Ages, 1993. Okay, but I have to go back even before that because, you know, stories are the most fun and we're down here in Virginia. And I actually, my first uh, job after graduate school, I worked on the Senate Armed Services Committee for Sam Nunn when he was chairman of the committee. And John Warner, another great Virginian, was ranking member of the committee. And uh, those were, that was in the 1980s. Uh, those were the halcyon days of uh, defense, strong Senate defense leadership. Um, and, uh, you know, I was, I was actually the first female and um, the first, uh, one of the first Yankees on the committee staff. They used to say to me, Sherry, we're going to teach you how to talk Southern. <coughs> and you can see how well it worked. Because um, I am not a native Southerner, but I have so, but with the military, and I got, you know, in the 90s, so for eight years, I was the chief environment safety and health officer for the Department of Defense. Um, and I visited military installations and bases all across the U.S. and globally. Uh, and, and most of the time, most of that period, we were actually not talking about climate change at all. Um, we were addressing cleaning up contaminated sites, Superfund sites, or complying with air, water, and waste laws or conserving endangered species. Um, not too far from here, down in North and South Carolina is a longleaf pine where the um, endangered red cockaded woodpecker, I see some heads on, like to make its home, particularly on military bases. And you know what? The military, the Army, and the Marine Corps in particular and others have done a great job in protecting the habitat for that endangered red cockaded woodpecker. Not without some pain in the first, year, first few years, but uh, you know, it's a testament to and a tribute to the leadership of our armed forces uh, and their stewardship uh, of, our, of our great nation. But I want to sort of start out here talking about the Arctic from its Cold War days, which is when I started working in this area, okay? Um, and many of you, I'm not quite that old, but um, many of you remember that, you know, the Arctic really was, was the province of our, of our submariners. Okay, and this is, you know, very, the very, um, uh, some of the early submarine days in the USS Nautilus. Um, that's, that's how we, that, that's what the Arctic was about in terms of our projecting military force there. And in the 1990s, in the early post-Cold War era, we were helping the, we were helping the Russians build down their nuclear capability. We were um, helping them dismantle nuclear facilities. And I ran a program for the Secretary of Defense at the time with the, with the Russians and the Norwegians on Arctic military environmental cooperation. Uh, and we, were used, we, were, we helped them build a cast to offload liquid waste streams from decommissioned nuclear submarines that were sinking in the Murmansk region. And we learned how to cooperate on environmental challenges in the region. We were focused mostly on that northwest part of Russia, close to the Norwegian border. The Norwegians were very worried that sinking Russian submarines might threaten their prize fishing grounds. Uh, and so we partly we created these new technologies to help ensure that the liquid waste streams were safely offloaded from um, those submarines. Okay, now I spent a lot of time in Russia during that year, during those periods. And actually I actually had three children while I was at the Department of Defense. So some of the times I went to Russia, I, had, I was pregnant. So, uh, but you can't go to Russia and not be part of, um, not part of the culture, right? Because as any good engagement officer, I know we've got some here in the room today, know that uh, you, know, you, have to, you have to be part of the uh, discussion. So um, I'll let you guess who was the designated drinker in some of our meetings. I always had one and it wasn't me. <laughs> okay, but somewhere in one of those pictures up there, it was always some officer who stood up and, and uh, uh, was a good partner. So we had some very good times with the Russians and we helped them. Now, 
That was the, that was the, that was, uh, the post-Cold War era. And Dr. Gong has shared with us some of the ways in which the Arctic has changed since that time. Um, and you can see how the sea ice max has, has, has uh, diminished significantly. Um, and you can see these are two pictures taken by uh, one of my NOAA colleagues, Jeremy Mathis, from the same ship uh, from the Healy, uh, two different years apart. And you can see the dramatic changes that have occurred uh, just in a couple of years in the same spot. OK, so uh, to put in context, you know, how we, govern, how we govern the Arctic today, there is an organization called the Arctic Council, which is the Arctic Eight Nations. Uh, and there, the member states, as you can see here in blue, are the sort of the Arctic coastal states plus a, a few others. But it has many permanent members, and now it has many observers, even including China. We're going to come back to that. And many nations that you'd say, why are they an Arctic nation? Well, what Dr. Gong showed us, that it's going to be uh, ice-free in the summer within our lifetime, and this is going to be an area of of commerce, of navigation, um, of not of research, and uh, probably much more. Okay. Now, one of the interesting things that happened just last uh, just last year was we negotiated with the Central Arctic nation with a number of nations a fishing moratorium uh, for the Central Arctic that runs for the next 16 years. I know our Coast Guard brethren here uh, know this this very well. And this is important right now because there has, yet, has not yet been a fishery in the Central Arctic Ocean. Uh, and this ensures that for at least for the next 16 years, um, the nation's signatories to this agreement have the opportunity to do research and observe the region, but not to fish in the region. As many of you know, many, of, many waters in other parts of the world are now heavily overfished. Um, now, China, for example, is also a signatory to this agreement uh, and also becoming increasingly active in this region. So over the next uh, decade and a half, we will be learning a lot more uh, about the Central Arctic. It's good news that the nations came together and agreed on this at a time of heightened tension among many of those nations, but it also shows you uh, what perhaps the ultimate prize of the Central Arctic may be someday. Okay. Now, for the military folks here, uh, we've had uh, in the past an Arctic Security Forces Roundtable, sort of a group just like you would have here in, in Norfolk of, of the militaries in this room. You'd gather on a regular basis and look at your common challenges. Well, the Department of Defense had a Security Forces Roundtable that was founded back in 2011, had, has had a number of annual meetings to look at how to cooperate. Um, Russia has been not invited uh, since its incursions in Crimea uh, and Ukraine a few years ago. So the vibrancy of this organization has diminished a little bit. But one that continues to go strongly is the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, um, which meets regularly. And the, uh, co the Coast Guard of the Arctic nations not only, um, not only work together, but now they're exercising to certain agreements on search and rescue uh, and oil spill. Uh, as well as supporting the um, science and technology agreement, which was recently signed uh, with by the Arctic Council nations. Uh, what's also very interesting, and we had just at the Wilson Center just 10 days ago, we had the National Guard Arctic Interest Group. And I must say that was a group that I didn't even know existed until 10 days ago. This was about eight national chiefs uh, uh, of, national, of, the, of their guard bureaus from Alaska to Montana, Minnesota, New Hampshire, Maine. Uh, we had a few others who now are meeting on a regular basis as leaders of their state national guards to address common challenges of being able to operate in the Arctic. Everything from equipment to logistics to transportation uh, to supporting uh, some of the first responder missions which may be needed in the region in the not too distant future. OK. Um, there have been a lot of studies on, uh, the, cha on the changing Arctic in the last um, couple of years. And I want to share with you just a, a, couple of, uh, a couple of them, particularly the ones that uh, this one was led by General Lester Lyles, retired Air Force four star, 
done for the State Department a couple of years ago. I, I served on this as well. Um, we pointed out that the U.S. really needs to up its game in the Arctic. And I'd say that, uh, in fact, our Secretary of Defense, Secretary Mattis, said that not too long ago. Um, he was up there and he said, you know, the U.S. needs to, uh, to up its game. So this is not, this is not a new refrain. Um, we, we pointed out that, you know, we, cooperation continues to be the norm and we should work as hard as we can to preserve it, but we must prepare for a changing future. Uh, because with the sea ice changing so rapidly and opportunities emerging, um, there will inevitably be competition both for resources and uh, potentially for presence in the region in the future. So we need to increase our presence. Um, we need to deal um, in a clear-eyed view with, with Russia, which of course is, has the longest Arctic coastline. Um, and has been increasing its military force posture and its, its other its, and its economic posture there as well. And at the same time, we need to strengthen our confidence building measures because we know that to get anything accomplished in the region, you need to work together. Um, the Council on Foreign Relations also uh, conducted a task, a study on the Arctic a few years ago, two years ago, uh, in some way similar, chaired by Admiral Thad Allen, former coming out of the Coast Guard and Governor Christy Todd Whitman, former governor of New Jersey. Um, and in some ways, we, we talked, so the findings are somewhat similar, a little less focused on defense, uh, a little more focused on the broader um, geostrategy of the region. And uh, what's very clear, and Dr. Gong made clear from a scientific perspective in his, in his presentation, and what we said in this report is what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. And now we see uh, in fact, we have some of the first climate migrants um, in, in the nation are now those that are moving from some small villages within the Arctic. New talk in particular is having to relocate completely. Uh, the U.S. Agency Arctic Strategies, it's important for those of you working in government to know, you know, there have been a long history of Arctic strategies. Uh, the Navy in particular in the last few years has done a lot to address that. I'm sure Dave Titley will discuss that in his remarks coming up. The Air Force is developing its very first Arctic strategy right now um, as, it, as it looks to uh, uh, across the region and how it needs to position our forces to operate there. The Coast Guard has had long had a robust Arctic strategy, uh, and I think we're going to see more now. The Navy is revisiting its Arctic strategy. I don't want to get ahead of them, so they'll have time to put that forward. And as you can see now, NORTHCOM with a new commander. In the military command structure, we actually have three commands which have some connection to the Arctic. NORTHCOM, which is uh, based, it's headquartered in Colorado Springs, sort of the U.S. and Canada, North American, but also UCOM uh, has, has had a role traditionally and with NATO, with NATO Summit today, and now the new command being announced, one of which will be based right here in this region. Uh, that it really signals our increased presence in the region. And then, of course, Pacific Command has long had the forces assigned to Alaska Command based in Alaska. And as you can see, and this is, again, this is not a new slide. NORAD is updating its strategy as well. They're having a symposium up in Alaska next month, uh, really relook at their, whole at their whole strategy. So I think you're going to see some more coming out of that command um, in the not-too-distant future as well. Now, this is an interesting slide and shows you Russia's um, Arctic buildup in the last few years and the extent to which they've added forces, created a new command. Uh, what's often true with Russia is they talk bigger than their posture, so sometimes they can't fully fund it, but at the same time, I think it's important to take seriously that, that Russia considers the Arctic to be very much a part of its national identity. You know, in a way that if you, you know, you, it's hard, sometimes hard to know the U.S. is an Arctic nation if you're not specifically talking about Arctic strategy or you're not in Alaska. But it's, it's not possible in Russia to um, forget that a lot of Russian identity, 20% of the GDP comes from the energy resources and mineral resources in the region. They've long had industrial-sized cities across the Arctic, and they are prepared to operate as an Arctic nation. Um, 
Okay, I think we won't spend a lot of time on this because I'm going to let the Coast Guard colleagues talk about icebreakers, but suffice it to say that uh, we, we don't have enough icebreakers in our fleet. We now have a program to add um, at least one more, but we really should have a total of six, three medium and three heavy in our fleet, uh, particularly when you see, um, let's spend our last slide uh, on China. China released its very first Arctic policy in January of this year, uh, which, which in some ways is not brand new. They've been talking about the Arctic for a few years, but it codifies uh, much of what they've been thinking about. Probably you've heard of the Belt and Road Initiative, their initiative to sort of connect Asia uh, to Europe and create a, both a land and a maritime bridge. The Arctic policy shows you their polar silk road, the polar dimension of it. And as you can see, hopefully on this map here on the right, <clears throat> that eventually, that China envisions that it will operate first across the Russian coastline on the northern sea route to get to ports in Europe. But eventually, as we saw in Dr. Gong's slide, when the northern, when the central Arctic opens up within the next 20 to 40 years, in the summertime, they'll be able to operate across the central Arctic Ocean um, in the actual polar route, at which point they will then be free of either you, right now, you know, China's got to go through the Straits of Malacca or Straits of Hormuz, Matt, you know, where there is heavy U.S. presence uh, and has been for decades. If, now, if they go use the Northern Sea Route, they will, of course, have to work closely with Russia as they are today along the Russian coastline. Um, but who knows what the future may bring in the Central Arctic Ocean uh, that has neither, uh, that does not have a single nation uh, guarding that, um, that route. So their plans are quite ambitious. Um, it's an interesting question whether this is a quest for resources to feed their very large population. You know, they've certainly been on a quest for resources across Africa and South America to provide minerals, energy, food uh, to feed the vast population. And is it also part of a global quest for influence across uh, greater parts of the globe? So there are many, and they've come on very strong also in their research community. I'd say since we're here at a, at a very distinguished research institution, Chinese um, ocean science research institutions have grown significantly in the last number of years. They've deployed uh, scientists strategically across the Arctic uh, from Alaska, Canada, Norway, Iceland, Greenland. Foreign direct investment is up significantly, particularly in Greenland whose sovereignty is in flux now as it becomes increasingly independent from, from Denmark, and in Iceland, a small country that was teetering on the edge of financial collapse just a few years ago. So uh, China is uh, a nation to watch and observe. Obviously, we cooperate with them in the scientific realm. We cooperate them with them in a search and rescue mission, but it's important to continue to think through strategically where they are going as a nation. And I think I will close on that point and uh, turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you all very much. I think next we have um, Admiral David Titley yes. joining us remotely. Let's, uh, while I'm trying to figure this out here, uh, let me just apologize I'm not there in person. Uh, one of the many things that I find out I'm really not qualified to do is uh, run my own calendar. So I managed to double book myself for a speaking engagement at both Penn State and William and Mary today. Uh, finished the Penn State one about 15 minutes ago, and now we're here. Okay, I'm just going to leave them like that. Whatever you see, because okay. at some point it's going to become evening and you'll want to move beyond this. All right. Okay, so I'm just gonna, uh, you, you've heard some of this before. Uh, I'll, I'm gonna give my, my kind of cut on it. So I don't know how much background you had, uh, but I was in the Navy for 32 years and uh, my last assignment was working for Admiral Ruffhead, who at the time was the 
chief of naval operations, and he asked me to take a hard look at the Arctic, and the net result of that was the Navy started its task force on climate change, really focusing on the Arctic. We saw that was the climate issue sort of uh, near as a sled, if you will, but it was really just a harbinger of, of things to come. So as you've already heard, the ice is uh, changing. It is certainly less, especially in the late summer and early fall. It's also a lot thinner now, and that's allowing uh, both more transport uh, with, with less uh, ice breaking capability to actually be successful up there. And uh, it is greatly changing the, the ecosystems, but we're gonna kind of concentrate on the, on the security aspect. So one of the things I was asked to do is talk about how this links to Norfolk. Well, we'll talk at the end of this about the second fleet standing up and, and what that may or may not mean for the Arctic and for ships that are, that are stationed in Norfolk and, and staffs that are stationed in Norfolk. But uh, it's also very important to remember that as the land ice melts, primarily Greenland, that ha also has a huge impact on Norfolk on the infrastructure. Uh, as I'm sure many in the audience or most in the audience know that uh, Norfolk is, is kind of a hot spot, if you will, for uh, sea level rise for a variety of technical reasons. Uh, but as the global sea level comes up, Norfolk is particularly affected uh, so this is a picture of a uh, scientist actually up on the ice fields in Greenland. And right now in the summertime, you get basically these rivers, rivers forming on the uh, tops of the ice fields, uh, draining this off. So in addition to warm temperatures, uh, the water gets down into the bottom of the uh, glaciers. It can actually further lubricate the glaciers. They flow out and they're flowing into, in general, warmer sea surface temperatures. So the whole cycle is, is greatly uh, sped up. And this uh, potentially, uh, as a you know planning number, people are now having to think in the terms of, let's say one to two meters, or for those of us thinking still in English, let's say three to six, three to seven feet uh, of, of sea level rise for the Norfolk Hampton Roads Tidewater area between let's say now and the uh, early part of next century. Uh, that's a lot. Uh, we've looked at some fairly detailed studies done by the Army Corps of Engineers for the uh, Norfolk Naval Base, the main naval base. Uh, probably okay up to roughly about three feet or so, but the issues are when you put a storm surge on top of this, and also, of course, when you look at the infrastructure that connects the base to the greater Tidewater region, the roads, uh, power, sewer, water, all of those start getting affected at sea level rise levels quite a bit lower than what will actually affect NOB itself. Uh, I know many are aware of this. Of course, there was a big task force, uh, but at the end of the day, this is gonna be really expensive. And as best I can tell, nobody really knows where that money to address these things is coming from. But one of the Arctic events, I think Sherry mentioned, you know, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. Well, this is, you know, this is the huge one here. When you start melting these ice caps, uh, that, that water does not stay in the Arctic. It, uh, it comes all over, including the, uh, the Hampton Roads area. We've talked about this it, it, to some degree, but, uh, but I think it's, it's worth remembering that, yes, the ice is melting. Yes, the, uh, uh, the, the, the weather itself is warm, warmer. Uh, I wouldn't call it warm, but it's warmer but the operating conditions in the Arctic are still very, very harsh. And frankly, unlike any other maritime operating environment, certainly that our surface forces deal with, there's virtually no infrastructure up in the Arctic. If anybody's been up there, you'll realize there's a whole lot of nothing up there still. Uh, we're still somewhere less than 10% of the Arctic Ocean charted to what I would call a modern standard. That is a multi-beam sonar and a global positioning system. Uh, when we talk about harsh operating conditions in some sort of paradoxical ways to operate in the arctic is becoming even more challenging you have more open water open water plus high winds means big waves uh, big waves at uh, temperatures below freezing means a lot of ice buildup uh, so you get also a lot more erosion on the shore 
So this is still a very, very, very hard place to work. Tremendous amount of fog and restricted visibility in the summertime when you have warm air coming over that ice. Obviously, you have the ice itself in these marginal ice zones. Uh, U.S. Navy surface ships are not ice strengthened. Uh, I've talked to some of the commanding officers we've we've sent up there in joint exercises, like with the Canadians and the uh, and and the uh, Danes. And it's frankly, it's a white knuckle exercise for those guys. Uh, they can't bash up their billion dollar ship, but they still need to do their mission. And uh, you know, you're kind of relying on the lookouts and hoping you're getting some uh, radar reflection of the ice on your surface search radars. Uh, there are much better ways to do this and the US Navy needs to you know, be, be more aggressive at, at working those. I'll talk a few more slides on the security concerns uh, later, later on. And the transportation access, it's being mentioned already, and I think my next slide will, will get to that. So here's a, 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 a slide out of the, uh, the U.S. Navy's uh, current uh, 2014 uh, Arctic roadmap. Uh, Admiral John White updated this. He updated the one I did in uh, 2009. Uh, that red line has been kind of mentioned. This is the what we call the Northern Sea Route, or the, the line, the shipping route that goes uh, right across the top of Russia, uh, potentially from Scandinavia through the Bering Strait and then down to Asia. Uh, something that maybe people know, but maybe they don't know, is that we are starting uh, with a new class of liquid natural gas tankers uh, to actually see unescorted transits in the winter time. Uh, along that route. And that is frankly something I didn't think we would see this early, but last year, uh, one of the LNGs actually made a transit from, uh, from Scandinavia to China uh, in February, last I checked that was winter in the Arctic, along that red line without icebreaker support, and they did it at speed. That kind of attests to just how thin the ice is uh, in, in general. Now, is it gonna be like that every day? No, do you need to be careful? Yes. Uh, but these changes are, uh, are coming, and we need to be prepared for what will frankly be a very uncertain and, and unknown and to some degree unknowable world. Uh, but putting my defense hat on, this is not unique to the Arctic. We know how to handle uncertainty. You start looking at capabilities and what general capabilities you would need for a wide range of scenarios. And I would argue that's really how we should be thinking about the Arctic rather than trying to make some deterministic bet on what will our relations with China or Canada or Russia be in 20 or 30 years. Canada, I hope we know, although maybe I don't. Uh, Russia and China are probably less known, but my guess is we're going to need to make sure we have capabilities to assert legitimate U.S. interest in the Arctic because we are an Arctic nation. Okay, some of the security, uh, Sherry, again, mentioned uh, the, the Russians, you know, and they are, they are building or rebuilding security in the Arctic. Uh, some of the hardware is coming up from a very low level. Uh, some of the things that are frankly more concerning to me is how they've changed their command and control and their ability to do these very large scale, I'll call them snap exercises that include Arctic moving tens of thousands of uniformed Russian military personnel on very, very short notice. This makes our friends in Scandinavia and the Nordic countries really quite nervous. So of course, if we get nervous, we increase our readiness, the Russians increase their readiness, and you, know, you don't have to go back through history too far to understand this is not a long-term recipe for success. Sherry mentioned at Arctic Security Forces Roundtable. I had the honor of leading that for the uh, uh, Defense Department back in 2011. Uh, our government strategy or, or policy right now is not to engage the Russian military uh, on military issues by and large because of Russia's action in Crimea and Ukraine. Uh, this is something we need to think through. It's not an easy one, but you know we did, even in the height of the Cold War, we did talk to the Soviet Union about certain things. We're gonna have to really think through, should we be talking, not in any way to condone Russia for its actions, but should we be talking to Russia about its actions and mutual interest in the Arctic? They are the Arctic power. They have 50% of the coastline. Uh, Again, Sherry kind of mentioned uh, China. These are some slides from my good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Heather Conley from the, or Ms. Heather Conley from uh, CSIS, another uh, large well-known think tank in, uh, in Washington, DC. 
And it really shows how China has been working very hard and in a deliberate fashion to put together the so-called Polar Silk Road. I don't know how big these slides are on your screen, but if you can see that top left, I mean, Putin is not a stupid guy. He doesn't look very happy there. Uh, and I think he doesn't look very happy because he knows with the Western sanctions, the only people who have capital and technology and money uh, to invest in uh, Russia's Arctic right now is China. China looks pretty happy about that. Putin may realize this may be a tactical win and a strategic loss for him. I'd love to, uh, I'd love to know his, his real thoughts on that. And you can see how China has been working with a number of countries, Iceland, Finland, Norway, uh, and, and Russia, Greenland, although Greenland, of course, part of Denmark, and they're really building out this polar silk road in a very deliberate fashion. Our national strategy does not really talk about the Arctic. We do talk about our great power rivals, though. and uh, we do talk about, by name now, Russia and China. Well, they're up in the Arctic, and I would ask the Secretary of Defense, what are we doing? And Congress, it doesn't really matter what I ask, uh, but it was interesting. I testified before a hearing with Chairman Hunter, Duncan Hunter, and Ranking Member uh, Giramendi three weeks ago, four weeks ago, uh, and I can tell you, and you can read the transcript, the record, that the Congress is really getting quite frustrated uh, with the Department of Defense. Lots of studies, as Sherry mentioned, we have what I would call exquisite bureaucracy, studies and roadmaps and plans and all this kind of stuff. What are we doing? And I would argue we're not doing very much. Now, Secretary Mattis has a nice quote from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but it will be interesting to see if anybody within the bureaucracy in the building, as we would say, actually takes the secretary's words and turns that into some sort of action. The Navy has, as I'm sure many people know, stood up or stood up again, the second fleet. Uh, we realized disestablishing it wasn't such a great idea after all. Uh, Russia's mentioned there a lot. Second fleet back in the day used to do a lot of work in the Arctic. We will see where that goes. Right now, the Navy is on record of saying, hey, we're going to deal with the Arctic like we've always done, and that is basically with submarines. Uh, submarines do a lot of things, but they don't do sea control, and they are not an overt sense of presence. By definition, submarines are not presence uh, in the sense that, that you see them and, and everybody else sees them. If you do, it's a bad day for the submarine. So we're going to need to look at this. It's a very challenging operating environment. This is why in our original Navy Arctic roadmap, we talk about working with our allies, working with the Canadians, with the Danes, up in the Arctic to gain that knowledge. Uh, frankly, we have not done that now for several years, and it's not completely clear to me if the Navy is going to or going to be told to re-engage and start thinking about what that uh, transient ice-free Arctic looks like and what are the right capabilities to bring to that uh, discussion because right now they're not there and uh, I think we are at, at increasing strategic risk of getting getting uh, caught flat-footed here. So with that let me stop and uh, turn this back over to the moderator. Thank you. Yes, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity to come down and, and speak uh, and kind of give you an insight to what we're doing uh, inside the Beltway in my uh, area of, of, uh, of operations, if you will. Uh, I'm going to start off with a couple of disclaimers. Uh, one is I speak for my office, not for the management, uh, and, and the management being Washington, D.C., so don't Please don't take anything away from that I'm speaking for the president of the cabinet or anybody else inside D.C. Um, and I will also use, uh, I use words and terms and with great authority of which I uh, don't have a good definition for. Uh, such terms as maritime security, maritime threats, the interagency inside the beltway. These are terms that we banter about and we routinely use them and we have no idea what we're talking about. Uh, but it's, uh, it's all good, and it's, it's my business, and I do it every day. Uh, first slide up there is uh, whole of government collaboration, building a network response to maritime threats. So maritime threats we don't define except by listing them. 
Um, and then uh, whole of government is sure, it's the whole of government, uh, whatever that means to everyone in, individually. And, we'll, and so with that as a starting point, that's what we're gonna start building. Um, I am the director of something called the Global Maritime Operational Threat Response Coordination Center. And the, it's an acronym within an acronym. The, the middle, the M stands for Motor Maritime Operational Threat Response Plan. And that is a plan signed by the president in, 19, in 2006 uh, that requires agencies inside the Beltway when responding to maritime threats to coordinate their operations prior to the operation. Uh, and these are uh, all non-military maritime threats. Uh, and that, that plan's been in effect since 2006. And it's used every day. Uh, you don't see it. You don't hear about it much. Uh, but it's, it's coordination inside the Beltway for such things as uh, illegal migration, drugs, fisheries violations, uh, piracy, uh, cyber, uh, and th those types of threats. So we don't, we don't define threats. We define threats by actually listing the threats. And then we just keep adding them as we as we get as we go further. And we did not when we wrote the plan, Arctic and, and sea ice melting was not a threat, uh, but apparently it's becoming one. Uh, so in the operational area, um, I have authority to. I'm the executive secretariat for the, the for the coordination of the plan inside the uh, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, I also get my authority to operate uh, and talk to people. Uh, as designated by the Joint Staff to facilitate the DOD's uh, interagency uh, operations, uh, non-military, uh, and also Presidential Directive 18, signed by President Obama in 2016, I believe, uh, says that it, all agencies can use the GMCC, that number one, I exist, which is nice to know, uh, and then and they can use us to uh, coordinate uh, maritime response. Uh, and again, I said coordinate what? Maritime threats, maritime threats of, of all kinds and worldwide, global. And when we named the, op the my office th was stood up in 2010 after the Marisk, Alabama piracy incident. Um, when we were naming it, uh, we actually you know, had to come up with a, the first word and global sounded, national sounded too small, universal sounded too big, so we picked global. Um, and, and, that's, and that's where we are. The Arctic, piece of this, uh, Admiral Allen was, uh, was uh, the Commandant of the Coast Guard when I was uh, in uniform, and his first uh, look at the Arctic, uh, his approach was there is now water where there was no water before, and everything else is immaterial. Uh, why, how, it's, it's not, it doesn't matter. There's water there, so if you're, if you're a maritime agency, uh, you need to worry about this new environment, and you're gonna end up operating up there. Uh, and as the, as the Admiral said, uh, it's, it's different up there. Uh, it's, it's, it's colder, it's darker, it's wetter, and, and all the things that uh, people operating in the ocean understand, uh, and, it's, and it's a long way from anything. Uh, and I would, it's unique, the maritime environment is unique for response, and it, it will be, in, as it is in the Arctic, it'll be uh, as unique up there, adding distance and time, to, uh, to all that and, and the weather conditions, there are very few laws, regulations that, uh, that apply, one being, uh, the major one being law of the sea, and we didn't even sign that one. So uh, we're working from a little bit of a disadvantage as a nation, but uh, that doesn't mean we don't do it. That doesn't mean we just throw up our hands. It is complicated, but uh, it can be, can be solved. Can I get the, oh, I can do this right here. Here we go. Our approach in the maritime has been, and this is through years of, uh, of missteps, if you will, uh, we've learned valuable lessons. One is uh, we need to have a whole of government approach. We used to call it, the, we call it the interagency. We still call it the interagency. Again, the interagency is not a building in Washington. It's a group of people, depending on which day uh, and which problem you're trying to solve, you get those people who can solve that problem for you Bring, to them, bring them to the table uh, and work the interagency. Uh, it's, it's been defined as an operating space below the cabinet level, political level, and, and, uh, and above the, uh, uh, the junior staff level. Uh, and, it's, and it's also uh, been a process. So it's, it, we kind of work at whatever we need. As we approach the Arctic, 
and the threats that will arise, and we don't know what they are, therefore we're not, we in the interagency maritime response world have looked at it and said, I'm not going to be able to build what I would like to build, and that's as a military background and a military thinker, what I would like to build is a chain of command. I would like to put somebody in charge of maritime threats in the Arctic and maritime on Arctic, and you're going to, we'll see these happening, and this is not uh, to disparage the, uh, the military thinking, because there are, there are needs for that, but it's been my experience and our experience in, in maritime threat response that if you build something, if you have one threat, you can solve it with a thing, and that thing can be some kind of joint staff, some kind of joint task force, some kind of joint something, usually with somebody in charge. Uh, and all resources flow to that person, unity of chain of command, unity of command. And those tend to work very well when you're trying to solve a problem. Um, a joint task force, uh, Southeast, uh, JADF South, not Southeast, JADF South is, a, is, is a, the gold standard in interagency cooperation, both military and, and civilian. Uh, it, it is designated and designed to, to solve one problem, and that's drug monitoring and detection and then they turn it over to the Coast Guard for the interdiction piece. But it does fabulously well, and it, and it works very well. But when you expand that to all threats, whatever they might be, and you don't have them, you don't know what they are right now, it's very difficult to build. So what we've done is kind of change the thinking. And the thinking is rather than build a whole of government structure, uh, we looked at building a whole of government process. And the process is the decision-making process. And this is, this is what it is. And it's, the, it's an empty table. And our, my job in the, in the maritime threat, and we will, as we move into the Arctic, it'll be, the, it'll, it'll be that also, is my job in DC is to, set, is to bring the table to the problem. So we bring the table to the problem we find the right people to sit at that table for that particular issue, whatever that issue might be. We get, they come to the table with all their number one knowledge and number two, their authorities. And the authorities are uh, spread across all kinds of uh, agencies inside the Beltway and more and more every day. Uh, as the doctor said, I, there are agencies that pop out of the woodwork that you've never heard of before and when we have an issue, I get people, I've, I've never heard of before, and, and I'm, we're introducing ourselves on the telephone, which is not a, probably the best way to approach a problem, but sometimes you have to. Um, they come to the table with authorities. They speak for their agency, and meaning they can agree to, they can head nod in the affirmative or negative that, yes, that their agency is authorized to do that, and they will do that. Uh, and then we, then we look at the problem, and we have an agenda, and the agenda is very simple, is to define Who's, who's lead, and then what do we all agree it needs to be done about that particular issue? And then we all speak with a one voice, so who's the lead, who's the lead for speaking for the US, U.S. government? And that's about it. Okay? But we don't leave the table till we solve that. And that may take days as the as, as situation changes for a, a drug interdiction or some kind of uh, illegal migration or or handling of, of people or money or weapons uh, or pirates or that sort of thing. So these things change and then we can, we're agile enough to move between agencies. Say if it's a U.S. citizen, FBI, your lead agency for this because you have the authority over U.S. citizens, good. Except that the situation now changing, therefore maybe DOD needs to, needs to take the lead and we'll, we'll alter between the, between the two. It is about, that's, that's the process. How do you build that? And this is, I think, why uh, what I was trying to bring and what, what I was asked to bring. How do you build that way of thinking uh, to a group that has set procedures, and I'm thinking of the military, for, for instance, and in, in prime example, has set ways and set ways to solve problems. How do you bring a new way of solving problems without new authorities, without building uh, massive buildings, without massive infrastructure? and joint chains of, com uh, chains of command. How do you build that unity of effort? And that's what we've been trying to do. You build it with trust. 
And one of the bumper stickers we've, we've put up at many conferences with the maritime operational threat response process is we operate at the speed of trust. That's all I have inside the Beltway. Either people trust the process or they don't trust the process. There is no, I have no authority to drag anyone to the table. The president said you, you will coordinate, but that's all it says. You will coordinate. What does that mean? I have no idea. Okay? And I helped write it. Okay? it, it uh, there, are, there are triggers. The triggers are vast and vague as they are anytime he's, anybody's trying to, has, who has written a policy inside the Beltway or anything between two agencies, two nations, it's vague, it's purposely vague, because that's all you're gonna get agreement on. Uh, specifically, you'll never, you'll never agree to anything specific. Uh, so therefore, we, we backed off and we agreed to basic principles that we will coordinate, Roger, coordinate, we will talk, that's good, and then we'll uh, try to solve problems, that's good too. How do you do it? Well, you do it with networking and trust. And I think that's things we, we will take those lessons as we, in the maritime response world, start looking at the Arctic and, and the new threats that arise in the Arctic. We'll take that same networking, uh, which is part of this, uh, and also, uh, and we'll start building that trust that goes with that. And there's a, there's a smart uh, general who said you can't surge trust uh, in, a, in, a, in a crisis, and that's, that's absolutely true. So you have to build that and get that going uh, early on. What are the threats up there? I have no idea. Uh, they're going to be, we've listed some of them here, they're, they're going to be changing. Uh, who's involved? U.S. agencies, there are many, there will be more. Um, and then, probably more so we're seeing in our world changing is civilian agencies being more involved. I, the last 10, 15 years, have been inside the bubble of, of the Beltway and working, making the sausage with the interagency and coming and spitting out a solution, and it's been government to government, all dot mil, dot gov, uh, except that we're seeing with social media and the, the internet and information flow, which has become so much easier and, and so much quicker, so much better, is I need to talk to the civilian agencies. I need to talk to, to owners of ships. I need to talk to the agencies themselves, the uh, industry itself, uh, and we're working that. We're trying to do that more and more. Uh, we used to run exercises on uh, terrorists taking over a cruise ship. And I sat through many, many of them, I'm sure most military people have sat through the, the, the terrorist response to a cruise ship. That, that's a good one. We, we run that one every couple of years. It's a great one, and we're really good at it. Uh, it's never happened before, but we're really good at it. Um, and God help those terrorists if it does happen, because we're ready. Um, we, we, every one of them, we failed to talk to the ship owner. You know, we didn't talk to Carnival Cruise Line. We talked to, we, we, we went to some intel agency who had their plans for the ship, but we never talked to the cruise lines and see what they had and what they were doing about it. They have coordination mechanisms also. They have, uh, they have some better knowledge uh, than we do on passengers, where the locations are for everything, where all that stuff, they have all that stuff. Uh, if you're looking for a bomb in a box, which is one of our other uh, favorite uh, WMD exercises, some, uh, some stray container with a nuke in it, uh, which is always fun and fun for a laugh, uh, is the, uh, you know, talk to the shipping agent. He knows what the container is. We don't know where it is. We're going to be running around with a radio, radioactive detectors saying maybe it's over here. They know where it is. They know where the containers are. And we have to bring them into the process. So bringing civilians into the government process is going to be a challenge. Um, because, uh, what, did they, what did they mention, trust? Oh, yeah, we don't trust them. Uh, and they don't trust us. Uh, and so we're, we're working that. And we're going to work that slowly. So in my, in my business, we're reaching out slowly to bring in agencies. Uh, and we will continue to do that. Does it all make sense? Good. All right. Ad hoc responses, ad hoc networks. That's what we have. Everyone has them. They work. They work most of the time very well. You call your friend. Your friend knows a friend, your network survives, your network takes action, your network works. Okay. Until the day you leave. And then somebody else has come in behind you and reinvent that network. Uh, but they're, they're still in existence, they still are very, uh, very active. And in the Arctic environment, new environment, uh, I think they'll be, that's where you start. You work with your friend that you met at the conference, 
uh, in uniform, and you know he sits at an operations center somewhere in Greenland. Uh, he's your guy. Arctic Coast Guard Forum is, was one of those. It's all about networks. Very few agreements. Right now they're all networking. Um, then we move to, as we evolve, we move to uh, national level coordination frameworks and process, and that's what I work in now. Uh, other countries are working that way also. Uh, and uh, Canada has their own. Uh, uh, and where uh, England has their own, New Zealand has their own, uh, Australia has their own. Uh, different than ours, as I would expect it to be. Uh, and I, I would never try to sell them our program. Uh, and they, uh, but the future is now connecting those whole of government nodes to other whole of government nodes. Uh, and we've done that in the last couple of years. We've, we have a, uh, an agreement, information sharing agreement uh, with, uh, uh, with Canada, with Australia, with New Zealand, and, uh, uh, and uh, England. I mean, I'll leave, who I leave out? Yeah, so that's, uh, so those are working and they're, and they're set up to start building that trust. Cha exchange information. And we define information as anything you want to ex exchange with me from your whole of government. And if you can, please, please exchange information. There'll be other, other networks get set up, military networks get set up for data exchange. Data exchange is different than, than information exchange. Data exchange means I get to plug in the back of your computer. Uh, and if you go to any conference, uh, there'll be, uh, with Russia, there'll be a Russian guy with a, with a stick and say, would you mind if I plug in the back of your computer? Uh, of course you, of course you mind. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 but we'd mind not only with the Russians, but we mind with the Canadians. You know, they don't get the plug in the back of our computers either and, and read the databases. So we're a long way from that information, the data exchange. We're, we're trying to work information exchange. So with that information exchange will be operational environment, will be response. With the trust, you can, you can talk to the country, you can call that country when you need them. You can talk about the problem, uh, the response to that problem set, and then hopefully solve the problem. And I think uh, as we move forward, as we more of that trust-based networking, trust-based collaboration uh, and coordination, is, and it's going to be needed as we, as we face the new complicated uh, problems that are coming our way with, with Arctic, um, again, being more water where there wasn't water before. So thank you. All right, I'm coming back in with a little bit of housekeeping. We're a little bit behind schedule, but I have three pieces of good news for you. First, we'll take a few questions now, but we're gonna make it part of the break as well, so please refresh your coffee, get up, move around if you need to. Second, you're gonna get a break pretty soon after uh, the Honorable Joshua Sachs speaks, uh, where you'll get your lunch, and then the best piece of news, if you did attend our April 20th conference, we are not getting kicked out of this room at 2 p.m., so I encourage you to stay, network, and mingle. <laughs> okay, so we will take a few questions. Please refresh your coffee, use the restroom as you need. We'll take uh, maybe two questions, okay, two, three sure, questions. Sure. So, so uh, this has been a, a good conversation about the problems in the Arctic. Uh, uh, Admiral Titley talked a bit about the second fleet being set up and that's uh, pertinent to the folks at Norfolk. Um, my question is, as we think whole of government, who does the second fleet need to be, be in touch with? They're standing up. They're just starting. Um, who, who are the people across the government, across DOD too, but, but across the, the whole of government that they need to be in touch with in order to be able to do their job? Who, as they start their Rolodex, who do they need to be plugging into it? Is that for me? Sure. Uh, my, my initial reaction would be they have a well-established uh, chain of command, which they will get all their orders from and they will operate in accordance with and all that. Uh, they need to become aware of probably networking out to both civilians, both industry, because they're going to be operating in an, in an environment where it's likely not a mill-to-mill -mill exchange. It's likely going to bump into civilians. So you can, they should reach out to their civilian counterparts, the, the industry. It, it, you mentioned the... Uh, uh, LNG shippers. Why not? Why not become familiar with how they operate? Uh, it's, it seems to be a big mystery how, uh, how civilian shippers operate and their, their routes and how they, how they move their routes. Um, I think that's, that's a good start for them. And then network uh, both 
legal as they move up the chain of command inside Washington, um, Department of State and Department of Justice. If you're in, if your maritime security is dealing with security for me is dealing with civilians. You're going to have to figure out how to deal with civilians and then dispose of whatever you have, whatever you whatever problem you solve, especially for the Second Fleet, unless you sink it and make it go away, which is one response, you know, <laughs> then you own it. And once you own it, you want to get rid of it. And you want to hand it off to someone else. So you've got to figure out the way, way to do that. And that network will help out so you don't surprise somebody in the middle of the night would say, hey, I've got a large container ship that I just seized on your behalf. But would you like it now? You know, and the answer is no. No, please no. And please make it, give it back. Please give it, or the container, or the person. You know, if you, whoever you interdict up there or bump into, you've got to move it to the next level, either arrest it or make it go away. Or sue it, either one. <laughs>